I'm Kier. I'm Haley. And I'm Jay from Gallifrey Public Radio. A podcast member of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the one you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And get ready, because geekiness begins in three, two, one. You have been granted clearance by director Phil Coulson. Stand by for S.H.I.E.L.D. debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the S.H.I.E.L.D. director. And now it's time for your scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Stargate Pioneer. I'm Agent Haley. And I'm Agent Lauren. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., a Marvel Comic Universe podcast. This is podcast number 90, discussing the 2014 X-Men Days of Future Past. This podcast is recorded on Wednesday, September 16th, 2015. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a fan-based podcast on the ABC television show Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Marvel's Agent Garter, Marvel's Daredevil on Netflix, and the general Marvel comic universe. Because of snarky speedsters. (laughs) If you'd like to talk to us about snarky speedsters, you can find us at our website, legendsofshield.com. You can get a hold of us at our voicemail, 844 the bus one that's 844-843-2871 you can find us at our facebook twitter tumblr and youtube all legends of shield and you can find us at our forums forums.gunnageek.com or search gunna geek on the tap talk app this time on legends of shield we're going to be talking once again about our ant-man marvel crate giveaway we're going to talk about x-men days of future past the rogue cut We're going to talk about our weekly comic book news, both a S.H.I.E.L.D. report and Neil's Mighty Marvel moment. We're going to talk about the rest of the weekly Marvel news and your feedback. Now we're going to roll into X-Men Days of Future Past, row cut, and oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this might be my favorite comic book movie of all time. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so glad we finally got to watch it. I know. I, I love this movie. I hadn't watched The Road Cut until yesterday, right? And I watched it twice. I watched it just the movie itself, and then I went back and watched it with the commentary. I was like, oh, this is so great. I love it. I was totally going to watch it with the commentary this morning, and then I got really distracted and ended up just spinning wool and completely forgetting what I was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> These things happen. Question for you ladies. I think in the realm of reimagined reboots recontinuations in the comic book world in the movie world i think this is way better than star trek way better than generations and way better than any terminator movie what do you gals think definitely agree yes i don't see anything that comes close to this this is fantastic now first class was pretty good but this one had both the former casts of the former what five movies or whatever and the new movie series together and then you get the continuity so then you're good to go right you've reset it takes pretty much all the best parts of both the old cast and new cast with some exceptions which i will probably rant about and then kind of just smashes them both together and i i love that i love the fact that they have They're like, okay, you know what? We're just going to do this. We're just going to give you more of what you love. And we're going to fix the stuff that you didn't like so much. And we're just going to have fun with it. And I like that. It was great. Of course, it was directed by Brian Singer, who did a lot of X-Men, actually. Yeah, he's, he's done a little bit. Yeah, he was supposed to direct The Last Stand. That fell through. They gave it to Brett Ratner. He was supposed to direct First Class. That fell through, and they gave it to Matthew Vaughn. So then Matthew Vaughn was supposed to direct this. That fell through because he wanted to do Kingsman. So they gave it back to Brian Singer. And I think this turned out pretty okay. Not bad. Decent little flick. Yeah. Do either of you two know how well it did in the box office? I can't remember how well it did. I can find out pretty quickly. I don't think it did as well as Avengers. Well, that's kind of a high bar. Well, this is a good movie. As a matter of fact, in my mind, it's right. It, it's clo- I, I haven't done the where does it fit in the 12 movies? Of course, it's not part of Marvel, so it's not the 13th movie. But where would it fit? It's definitely top five. OK, if we had to put it with 
all of all Marvel movies ever, it would definitely be top three for me, possibly even top two. Definitely top three. That's I'm, what I'm thinking. It's up there, yeah. It's up there. So the screenplay was by Simon Kinberg. Is that how you Simon say it? Simon Kinberg, yes. Also working on the new Star Wars movies. Yeah, and he was in the commentary with Brian. Oh, and he, yes, he was also executive producer on Star Wars Rebels, mm -hmm. which is a good show. It's out Yay. on Blu-ray now. Everyone should watch it. The next season is coming soon, right? Like in a yes, month or so? Yes, the next season is coming in October, I think. Oct I want to say October 14th. Mm. Really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. You know what? I did not have that on my list of premieres that I did for Gonna Geek. I'm going to definitely have to do that. Dang, forgot it. Uh, anyway, and also you had Jane Goldman and Matthew Vaughn on the story as well. Jane Goldman, by the way, I just looked her up because I'm like, I don't know. I looked her up. I don't know if any of y'all have ever watched Big Fat Quiz of, of the year, of the 90s, of the 2000s. It's a British panel show that uh, I got hooked on because of gifts on Tumblr. And it's just basically a bunch of comedians, actors, whoever, just kind of take turns riffing and joking on stuff that happened over the course of the year, the decade, whatever. It's way funnier than it has any right to be. Just look up Big Fat Quiz of the Year on YouTube. They're all on there. They're all great. And I was just informed by our network producer, by the way, that Mrs. Stephen Wandrew happens to be listening to us tonight. Hi. Ooh. Hello. Hi, Steven's wife. Yeah, Steven. <laughs> Not Steven's mom, Steven's wife. Okay, so I'm turning this on, and I'm watching it, and I'm like, I don't remember it, because this is the first time I've seen it since the theater, so I'm like, eh, what happens? So the 20th Century Fox logo comes up, and Haley, you weren't here last week, but Lauren and I were both, this is Star Wars, this is Star Wars, we're not going <laughs> to get it in Star Wars. I'm like, ah, but at least we got it here. And then... It was the Marvel pre-roll. I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot this was in. It's so great. I like the Marvel pre-roll. Yay. And in the commentary, by the way, since neither of you two listened to it, Brian made a big deal out of the fact that they actually had to get a room full of Marvel lawyers to come in to watch the pre-roll to make sure, A, they didn't put in any other cards because what Brian wanted to put in a few extra panels, whatever. They would not allow that. And number two was that they didn't screw with the music. So they got the lawyers in. They watched it a few times. They were satisfied. They asked a few questions. They said, okay, you're good to go. And they're like, woohoo, we got the Marvel pre-roll. So that's cool. So at the very beginning, we'll, we'll just start there. The X-Men are being processed in what looks like Central Park. In, and I kept looking for Central Park, couldn't find it. Go figure. Anyway, the friends are all dead. Not necessarily the X Men mutants. Yeah, not all mutants are X Men. No, it's the bad future. The friends are all dead. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the good future. <laughs> Which of the friends would be a mutant, and what would their powers be? Phoebe. Phoebe's a mutant. Oh, that's obvious. What was her power? Singing. Mm, it'd be something you wouldn't expect. She could probably communicate with animals. Yeah. yeah, but it would be only like a certain kind of animal. It would be something really <laughs> only weird. Only smelly cats. <laughs> only flatworms. It's just something weird. So, uh, any of the other friends? Any, any of the other five? Mutant? I'll take that as a no. I don't know. Maybe Joey? Maybe? Uh, you know what? I would definitely see Joey as a mutant. I would like that he's like secretly a super genius. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, I was going to say he could be like the cannon fodder X-Men, but no, that could be Ross. <laughs> <laughs> that definitely would be Ross. It's the worst. That's great. He is the worst. So anyway, they're being processed. Ink is there. It is the one of three cameo or four cameos, whatever he has during the movie. He's all over the place. And then I hate that guy so much. It's a T two opening. They said it in the commentary. We did this to be like T two. I'm like, yeah. Well, who didn't see that coming? They got the skulls. <laughs> they got the flying robots. They got. It's so blatantly a either rip off or homage, depending on how you're looking at it. But it's it's kind of fun. It's very definitely one of those things that we, those of us who grew up in like in that era of watching those movies, kind of recognize as the bad future. Okay, so you've got a apocalypse happening around you. You've got a ton of sentinels looking for mutants and then killing them, and so you've got this boy who is a mutant just picking over the dead T2 pile, looking for stuff that he could use with a lamp, not, you know, broadcasting that he's there or not. So that kid's cable, right? We are agreed that kid's obviously cable. 
the kid is actually, yeah, and he shows up at the end of the movie, too, and we'll get to that at the end, but he is at the front and the back of the movie, and that's it. That's the only time you see him, I think. Yeah, but we are agreed that kid's cable slash Nathaniel Summers, whatever you want to call him, right? We are agreed. So does that mean Gene and Scott got better after, was that T3? X3? Or not T- X3, yes, not T3. Or it could be from another dimension, and then somehow he got teleported into this one through their own bad future, and his life just sucks no matter what future he's in, because string theory and also his life is terrible. Just wherever. Constantly terrible. Mr. Paracletes in the chat says, I don't remember Wolverine going into the water at the end with a thumbs up like T2. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it would have been better if he did <laughs> yeah that would have been cool okay so then we transition to moscow right and we have this huge battle which was awesome but you had mutants being killed left and right and then all of a sudden it doesn't matter yay never happened i loved that did you guys see what was coming as it was happening the first time you saw it oh uh, once they started dying i did because i'm like but they have scenes in the trailer that haven't happened yet. <laughs> Pre-knowledge. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. What about you, Haley? I'm trying to remember. I think I thought it was like a vision or something at the time. Mm. I don't remember what I thought. It was a long time ago. I honestly didn't know what I was seeing, but I liked the fight. I did start to get really upset when they all started dying, though, because I mean, those are characters I like. You guys, you don't know how happy I was when they started announcing, we're bringing in this character and this character. Like, they announced Bishop, and I'm like, oh my god, you guys, Bishop, finally, I can't believe of all the mutants they bring, I can't believe Bishop. And then they bring in Blink, and I love Blink. She's awesome. I have Age of Apocalypse, yes, I have Age of Apocalypse on, like, my bedside right now, the comics. I love her so much. And... I also did feel vindicated because in a fanfic that I wrote years ago for X-Men First Class, I brought in Bishop and Blink. And (laughs) they bring in Sunspot, and Sunspot's awesome, even if he doesn't look quite like how they did him in the comics, because in the comics, whenever he, like, goes into his mutant powers, he's all black with, like, the, the flame outlining him. Because, you know, Sunspot. And then they bring in Warpath, and Warpath is just awesome. I love him. He's great on X Force. And just all these characters, I love them. And then you see Colossus again, and you see Iceman and Kitty. And it's, oh my God, I love them so much. It's great. I was so happy to see them all. It was awesome. And you get I mean, Sean Ashmore and Kitty Pride, And it was, it was awesome. But then boom, it's gone. And I was like, what happened? What? And then you see them all again in a facility that looks exactly the same because they have the shrine up in both. And it's like, what? I, it's trying, what, did they all just move to, I don't get, were they holograms? I, I don't understand what's going on, but it was so cool to learn that Kitty was sending somebody back T2 style and trying to make things better. Yes. Or at least keeping them from all dying. Yes. For a little bit. Not quite making it better, but at least making it suck a little bit less (laughs) for them. Yeah. Specifically for them. Definitely bad. I love the X-Jet in this one. It's, it, oh, wow. It's awesome. And then just, oh man, I love old Magneto and old Xavier showing up again. Just every time those two show up, I'm just so happy. And they were getting along just fine. Oh yeah, because that's the thing. They're friends. They are. You know, they spent a couple decades trying to kill each other, but they're friends. <laughs> yeah. Wasted years. <laughs> have an argument see that's it he's like all these years we wasted we should have just been friends the whole time and i'm like they are so meant to be (laughs) okay it's kind of funny because right before i was watching this there's this series that ian mckellen is on called vicious it's him and derek jacoby and they play these committed partners of 50 years that are just sniping at each other and through the whole thing. So the whole time that old Xavier and old, I keep wanting to say Picard, by the way, every time I mentioned old <laughs> Xavier, that old Xavier and old Magneto are hanging out. I just kept expecting him to turn to Xavier and just say something extremely bitchy to him. And he, that never quite happened, at least with old them. Right, right. So then you got them all coming in and coming up with a plan. Okay, Lauren, last night I tweeted you, I have a big problem Mm -hmm. with the X-Men plan. Yes. I do. 
especially with the road cut. I don't think I would have had the plan, had the problem with the plan had I not seen the road cut. But in the road cut, eventually they bring in Rogue to duplicate Kitty Pride's powers, right? Yes. Well, if they would have thought about that from the beginning, they could have done the mind thing with two people at the same time, you know, Logan sending him back decades, and then another person, if it fails, to send him back two, three days. And so the big battle is unnecessary. But no, once he snaps back, it's going to lock whatever events he's gone back and changed into place. Yeah. Plus, I always took it that because of Rogue's location, that was just kind of a last ditch thing. That, that And that's the reason why Bobby didn't tell anyone that she was there. Bobby being Iceman for those who don't know this stuff, because how can people not know this? Right. Who gets his head crushed twice? No. <laughs> but he got better again. <laughs> yeah. He did. Sean Ashmore. And of course, his brother Aaron Ashmore is on Sci-Fi Network. Currently on Killjoys, used to be on Warehouse 13. But in any event, yeah, I just saw that. I'm like, yeah, I just, uh, okay. But since they took Rogue out of the theatrical cut, which I think is a big mistake, because it's a wonderful thing that they should have added to the movie. I, you want to, guys want to talk about that? How better the Rogue cut is than the... It's so much better. I like the theatrical version enough. But I just, I love the road cut. I mean, the whole X-Men movie franchise started with this meeting between Logan and Rogue and them kind of forming this bond of these two misfits who, even among the other mutants, just didn't quite know where they belonged. And then her coming back and kind of helping to finish guiding him through this, you know, this place to just kind of hold everything off for a little bit longer. I thought that was beautiful. And I just love seeing Rogue again, because she's been one of my favorite characters since I was like, I don't know, six or seven. From the cartoon, mine too. She is my favorite. She's fantastic. I don't know, I'm kind of getting a vibe for Kitty. Kitty's a lot of fun too, but... She just hasn't had enough room to grow in the movie franchise. Definitely not in the movie franchise. She's a lot of fun in the, the, the comics, though, seriously. Right. Okay, so they're in China, they decide to send Logan back, and then... Poof, he's back in 1972, and he... 1973. It's 73. Is it 73? I thought it was... I swear they said 73. I know the Paris Peace Accords were in 73, but I thought he went back to 72. My mistake. SP's wrong again. <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> so they go back to 1973, and he's a lava lamp. <laughs> and a waterbed. A <laughs> waterbed cracked me up. <laughs> With his claws. That's awesome. And that ass. Dat ass. Okay. Do you ladies need a moment? <laughs> I just, I was watching that scene today and I was thinking about him in the first X-Men movie. Right? And how he's like half the size. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, like comparing him. I mean, Hugh Jackman's a good looking guy. We can, we can all agree on that. Yeah. But the, okay. Comparing him when he started his Wolverine, he's like, yeah, he's a good looking guy to here where he's just like seriously just jacked up and he's kind of scary to look at at some points because his veins look like they're trying to escape <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was on an episode of ellen ryan reynolds said there's a level of in shape you should only be if you're gonna wear a necklace of ears <laughs> <laughs> he's at that level yeah well because who he was describing yeah i mean he does look terrifying and intimidating here yeah so i've been working out in the gym again I did so back in college, whatever, but I got hurt and had to lay off. So I'm back in the gym about three years now, and I'm just starting to get a defined back again. I just, I know he's been working out for like 15 years or whatever, but the dude is cut. And yes, understanding all this, I understand how he wants to, you know, cash in the roll and eat a freaking cheeseburger. I get that. Yeah. But also, like, what was it? I remember reading the dude does something where if he's going to be shirtless as Wolverine now, he doesn't drink water for like a day or something so that his veins can stand out more. That's horrifying. That's like bodybuilder type stuff. Drink some water, please. That's making me take a drink of water right now. That's making me take a drink of something. <laughs> so yeah, I can only imagine before that scene, he's like, oh, let me, you know, like Chris Evans in Captain America. Let me punch out some push-ups right now you know right before Haley atwell was like ooh, <laughs> touching his skin and stuff 
off topic a bit, but I love that the boob grab in Captain America right there was completely unscripted. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mr. Paracletes in the chat just puts, Hail Hydration! Yeah. Okay, so in the commentary, they mentioned something that I remember reading about at the time, but kind of just passed in and out. I didn't realize that Halle Berry was pregnant during the filming, so they only literally had so much time Oh, with you're her. kidding. Yeah, so... They were able to get all her scenes, I believe, in 16 days or something like that. And that's all they had, because after 16 days, she couldn't fit in the suit. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, that is not a suit that is very forgiving of, like, anything. So, And she was pivotal in the movie. They needed her yeah. for those few scenes that she was in as Storm. So, according to the commentary, they shot the end scene in the X-Mansion first. It was one of the first scenes that they shot. So, Halle Berry was there. You know, Scott and Jane were there, whatever. So they had to shoot that, and then they went to China, and they shot her scenes there, so. I love her haircut in this movie, by the way. Yes. She's rocking it. Definitely rocking it. And also during the commentary about this time, they said that there were, because the movie is roughly 18 minutes longer, there were 16 more minutes of music that they had to score for the Rogue Cut. So that apparently was a big deal for the two commentators. There you go. Yeah, I saw that one of the commentaries actually had the uh, guy doing the score. It's like Brian Singer and guy doing the score. They were in an apartment, like in a, just like a studio apartment or whatever, and uh, not in the best part of town, and they were writing the score for X-Men, and the people next door kept banging on the walls, cut that noise out! <laughs> like, yeah, but we're scoring X-Men! They're creating art! There you go. God, Mom! <laughs> Would you believe me if I told you I came here for the future? Yeah, that has never once in the history of anything worked. I like that Wolverine doesn't quite get it. Like, <laughs> he kind of knows what's going on, but he doesn't completely get it. <laughs> they definitely sent the wrong guy back. <laughs> they definitely did. I mean, they, they worked with what they... Well, technically, okay, in the comics, it, they sent Katie Pride back. Right. It was, I think, Jean... That sent Kitty Pride to Professor X. One of them sent Kitty Pride back. I have the comic. I haven't read it in a few years, but it, it was Kitty Pride that got sent back to younger Kitty Pride, and it has that really famous cover of. It's been parodied like everywhere of Wolverine in front of Kitty, and there's a, the pictures of all the mutants behind them, and it's like dead, dead, captured, with like the spotlight on them. It's been parodied in everything from Star Wars to uh, Star Trek, just everything. Doctor Who. Doctor Who? Yeah. There was like a comic cover. It had like all the different doctors. It's like, you know, regenerated, regenerated. And then it has, I think, 11 on it. Nice. Adam in the chat said that before we leave this topic, they had a ridiculous number of blackout days for various actors. And they did mention that in the commentary. They're like, oh, my gosh, we had hard outs left, right and backwards. We're really shocked that we were able to pull this together. And Patrick Stewart had to come back not once, not twice, but three times to f uh, film that final scene in the X-Mansion. It's like, ah, gosh, can these guys just get it right? Anyway. Logan's in the back, he's in the past, and you see him driving off in the car, which I think is an Oldsmobile or Buick or whatever, but anyway, they had the recreation shot. In the commentary, they didn't go into it whether it was remastered or recreated or if it was real, but they did have a shot of the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers. Yeah, that's one of those things that I don't know. Lately, it just feels kind of lazy to me. It's like, oh, look how different it was back then. We're like, yeah, we, 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 just, we know they went back to 1973. It was to set the time, granted, but also I think it was an homage. I think it had just been built. Well, and then X-Men 2, they had to change some stuff about that because of 9-11, I believe. So I, I just think it was a, a tip of the hat to all the individuals that lost their lives that day or whatever that yes we do remember that sort of thing yeah it had just been built in 1973 uh, or it had just been opened 1973 so i guess yeah that is kind of a but it's one of those things that uh in movies when they go back to the past anytime it's set in new york before 2001 obviously you know if it's a movie that was filmed pre-2001 you know it's like oh hey distinctive skyline but Nowadays, it's this shorthand 
for like there will be like this lingering shot and it did linger it's one of, it's one of those things where it's like if you film a movie in brazil they will you know do the thing on the the statue of christ in rio de janeiro re- whether or not it's set in rio de janeiro <laughs> yeah, right. it's just brazil that's, or that's where we're in at. paris they go to uh, the eiffel tower whether or not that has anything to do with the plot it's just one of those lazy shorthand things that really bugs me. In the commentary, they did talk about the Paris shot before when they were going to the peace conference, and it was just stock footage to just to show where that they were. And then Brian wanted fireworks because they were celebrating the end of the war, so they kept they added fireworks. Yay! Boom! 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 Yay! Tyrion Trask is in the hearing <laughs> in front of DC's top man. <laughs> I'm like, oh well, you know, it's kind of fitting of Tyrion. Yeah, he's he's always into something or other. But yeah, Bolivar Trask decides, hey, mutants are scary, right? Remember the whole Cuba thing? I created robots! These robots will protect us from mutants! These killer robots will protect us from the monsters. This can't possibly go wrong! He mentions Cuba, which is true, but I think what would scare the bejeebies out of him wouldn't necessarily be Cuba, it would be JFK! Well, yeah, that too, they but... They didn't mention that at all! Well, yeah, because it's a conspiracy. Of course it's- <laughs> Again, a slightly off topic. JFK was a mutant. I still remember when they were kicking around what the next X-Men movie was going to be about. I think it was uh, Matthew Vaughn was saying, oh, I'd love to start off with like a montage of the stuff that they were up to in the 70s. And it would start off with like, you know, the JFK assassination. And you'd find out that Magneto is controlling the magic bullet. And everyone at the time was like, oh, that's amazing. And then we find out, no, it's because JFK was a mutant. What was his power? JFK? It was wooing ladies. <laughs> I mean, how else you could explain Marilyn Monroe? He was Monroe? charismatic. Yeah, he had, like, gambit charisma. Why not? <laughs> and also an ability to make a lot of money, or at least their family did. Well, I, that's because his dad was a bootlegger. You could make lots of money with bootlegging. I mean, if you take a look at the Kennedy fortune and where they made their money, he literally pulled out of the stock market like three months before the fall in 1929. That is why the Kennedys have money is because their dad pulled out of the market then. It's like, wow, the fate of the world happened because of that. All right. So they go to Vietnam and we meet Major Bill Stryker for the first time (laughs) and we see Mystique again. And that whole scene was great. That was... I liked seeing Havoc again. I mean, it's nice to know someone survived. Yes. Yeah, not many did. Oh, my God. I am so angry. I am so angry about what happened to everyone from first class. Right. Well, not everybody, but most of them, right? It's like Angel and... Angel, Emma, Azazel, uh, Riptide. Just like, hey, all these people that we couldn't bring back. Oh, guess what? They're dead. They're dissected. Did you really want January Jones to come back as Emma Frost? I don't yes. want Emma Frost to die. <laughs> I like Emma Frost. Yes, I do. Well, granted, I wish they could have found a different actress, but uh, I like Emma Frost. She's such a fantastic character, and I wish they would one day actually get her right in the movies. That might happen someday. You know what? We should do Astonishing X-Men next week. Oh, that would be fun. Okay, what is Astonishing X-Men? Well, it's a comic run by Joss Whedon, but they made a motion comic of it. They oh. made a motion comic, and it's what the No More Mutant Serum stuff from X3 is sort of loosely based off of. All right. We could do that. Yeah, it's quite fun. Sweet. But, yeah, just, oh my god, I love all the X-Men. All of them. Except Ink, because he's not a mutant. <laughs> he's just got a stupid tattoo on his face. <laughs> yeah, no! Okay, the whole thing. First of all, I bought all of Young X Men because I was like, "Yay! All these all these mutants that I loved from New X Men Academy X and all that—they're going to be in this." And I wanted to find out what happens to Dust and Blindfold and Rockslide and all these other mutants I love. And then they bring in this, just this. Okay, I was about to say a word that you would have to beep, so I'm not going to say it. <laughs> but they bring in this other guy, Ink. And he's like, oh, I'm so awesome. I get these tattoos and I can have all these powers. So uh, he's just a terrible character to begin with. And then at the end, he's like, oh, he's not really a mutant. It's this tattoo artist who's a mutant who can imbue him with powers through these tattoos. So he gets the Phoenix Force tattooed on him and then uses these powers on somebody and then goes into a coma and everybody forgets about him because he was so terrible. (laughs) 
<laughs> but you know what he is? He's recognizable on camera. Yeah, and he's terrible. And he needed to be recognizable in all the timelines. It, it, all the way back in 1973, in the future. In- I hate him so much. Don't hold back. Tell us how you really feel. Why couldn't we have Toad again? They could, I mean, Ray Park's still working. All right. Do you need a moment to come down, Lauren? Take I a drink? I need a moment. I'm going to take a drink. I'm going to be over here taking a drink. Y'all talk without me. Okay, you know what we haven't talked about yet is how awesome Quicksilver was in this movie. He made the movie. It was so awesome. That's the best scene in the entire movie where he yes. beats up the entire room full of guards. It is. It, the kitchen scene. You know, like we have the hallway scene in Daredevil. This is the kitchen scene. Every scene he's in is just fantastic. He's, I love him so much better than Age of Ultron Quicksilver. He's, this is what Quicksilver is like. I like that he doesn't just beat everybody up. He's also like flipping their hats and giving them wedges and, <laughs> wedges and stuff too. He's like, what would be fun for me? Yeah. So when you were walking up to the door, I checked the registration in the car and saw it was a rental. Oh, <laughs> why you guys, when we pulled up, I went inside and saw the flight manifest. Why are you guys going to Paris? What's in Paris? Can I go to Paris too? <laughs> oh, oh! my mom knew a guy that could control metal. <laughs> and then that look on both of their faces. Oh, on even, both even better than that look was the one before where he's like, what'd you do? What'd you do? What'd you do? What'd you do? What'd and you then do? he finds out and he's like mouthing stuff to the guard. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. And the guard's like, uh-huh. You're going to get it. I love him. Yeah, that whole rescue scene was great. I mean, when I heard the cast, I was like, okay, this is pretty great because I watched, I guess, two and a half, three and a half seasons of American Horror Story. I got really frustrated with the season with the freak show. And I don't know, it didn't really seem to be going anywhere. I just got really frustrated. But he's fantastic in every season. So then I was like, oh, hey, they're casting him. This is going to be awesome. And then he was awesome. He was in the rescue scene after he does the glass vibration and stuff <laughs> and he gets Magneto out and he's like, yeah, holding the hand. It's like, yeah, whip lash. lash. And you could tell Magneto just wants to pummel him, or, him. but he's rescuing him. So all right, I'll go along with this. Why not? Sudden unexpected son is a jerk. <laughs> Oh, it, let, let's talk about the sister since we're here already. Okay, yes. So, yeah, sisters. there's two sisters, two sisters, and they it, it comes out in the road cut, but they talk about it in the commentary as well. The twin sister is upstairs, the little sister's down. Now, question for you, do the twins have a little sister in the comics? Yeah. Well, sort of. Polaris. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, Polaris is awesome. She's technically their half-sister, and she's also has the magnetic powers She's a little bit... Lorna, that's her name. Lorna Dane. There we go. She's actually, for a long time, was dating Havoc. Yes. The long-term, kind of on-again, off-again relationship. When the character was introduced, she was introduced around the same time that Havoc was introduced in the comics as well. And they kind of had a thing right at the beginning. But at the beginning, she was fake Magneto's daughter. And that was before they yes. even revealed the, the twins are his kids, too. Yeah. And then it's just been like this really long, complicated relationship between her and Magneto. And then in the most recent incarnation of X Factor, she goes off and helps like Gambit and Quicksilver and all them with uh, this uh, sort of mercenary-ish team. And the interplay between her and Quicksilver, where he's like, I'm your brother. And she's like, you're not my brother. And they just kind of hate each other is a lot of fun. And they don't trust each other, and they're bickering all the time. It's pretty great. Seriously, read anything X-Men that Peter David has written. It's a lot of fun. And he writes a really great Quicksilver. So Mr. Pericletes in the chat said, Quicksilver in Age of Ultron looks like the lead singer in Everclear. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> then you really might know what it's like. Wait, no, that's Everlast. <laughs> Everclear. Oh, yeah, that's Father of Mine. Yes. I got my 90s bands confused. I get all bands confused. Oh, yeah. She was pretty significant in Wolverine of the... I need to watch that again. The Wolverine of the X-Men cartoon. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was so great. And I have it all on DVD. It's all good. So, as they're going into the house, of course, the welcome mat had scorch marks and stuff. So, I, I thought that was really cool. And the mom's like, what did he do now? I'll get my checkbook. I'm like, <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. We just want to talk to him. Magneto's delinquent son. <laughs> He's playing ping pong with himself. 
And with all the stuff in the back, like all the ho hos, Twinkies, and <laughs> stolen <laughs> TVs. Dolly has an incredibly fast metabolism. It makes sense. It does, but there's a lot of electronics too, which is cool because, okay, so we got to talk about the science question here, I guess, as long as we're talking about Quicksilver. So we were asked during the live tweet by Mr. Paracletes, science question with an explanation point. So it's like raising your hand and I'm raising my left hand right now. Science question. How does the cassette player keep up with speed Quicksilver? Haley, I'm going to throw this over to you because you just, you happen to have a little bit of experience with speedsters lately. (laughs) I would think he just, maybe he like, I don't know how much you can crank up how fast a cassette player plays, though, because I think at some point you would just be shredding the tape. See, I don't know. I just responded knowing I was crossing the streams and said, the speed force just envelops everything (laughs) that touches him. And what I could have said was, it's the same sort of material that the tape player in Guardians of the Galaxy is made out of. There you go. Space stuff. So that's my best guess. My best answer is for you, Mr. Pericles. And then he also goes along and asks the second science question, since we're on the topic. How does one create electronics for the Sentinels, let alone program them without metal? And then we're, of course, talking about when Magneto comes by and he intertwines the rail metal into the Sentinels and programs them to his will. And I remember the first time I saw this going, that's not right. But. You know, after seeing it again, it's like Magneto can do whatever he wants. I mean, science, it's comics. Magnetism is basically magic in comic books. So, yeah, that's that's what's going on. There you go. Okay. So we get to the X Men mansion, the X Mansion, whatever. And, you know, the professor is, uh, you know, the professor is not home. He's, oh my God, I love angry, druggy. Well, okay, it's never really specifically stated that he's on drugs, but with the whole injecting his cure into him, it really makes him, plus the clothes and all, it really makes him seem like a heroin addict. Plus the 70s, so we've got the whole, The dude needs a haircut. He needs his teeth brushed, too. He needs a bath. I mean, I said it on chat yesterday, and I stand by it. It looks like he smells like a hangover and weed and, like, leftover shrimp. Like, he looks like he smells. He needs Hank just to dunk him in the pool or something. Yeah. And then Scott and I, we were watching this movie when it premiered on HBO, I don't know, like a couple weeks ago. And we were watching this part where we were like, what do you want to bet that this is the first time he's worn pants in like a month? (laughs) Like, he just walks around, like, he just forgets to wear pants or he just doesn't bother. He's just lost all hope. So he just wanders around not wearing pants. And Hank is just like locked himself in his lab crying. Hey, there's a little beast in you. I bet you. Yeah, I can see it. There's a little beast in you. There's a little beast in you. Come on. Come on. Let me see it. Let me see it. And then the two go at it up on the second floor. It's just, uh, it's oh, that's fun. what she said. <laughs> <laughs> well, they kind of do until, you know, they're thrown out into the first floor. And then Charles comes out. Hank, get down from the chandelier. I say that to my kids all the time. Get down. What? Don't break the chandelier. <laughs> wow. That whole bit. I. It was just so depressing and weirdly hilarious to me. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh because that is really sad, but no, it was funny. <laughs> okay, so and then the professor has his epiphany moment, whatever, with the little kid with the flashback of Mystique and or Raven, I guess, at the time. Yes. And Charles in the kitchen, whatever. And he decides to go, okay, we're going to fix this. And then they go break into the Pentagon. And I just want to say for a fact, I know this. That the prison that they're breaking into is a coffee shack. Yep. That's what's in the middle of the Pentagon. It's a coffee shack. Mm -hmm. Is it a particularly well-guarded coffee shack? Well, I mean, you got to get into the center. to. to, So, yes, it's well-guarded. But no, once you get there, it doesn't have 20 billion guards with glass guns. No. Does the coffee shack hold secrets? Is the barista a... um homicidal mutant with magnetic powers you know that is a possibility i you know i i didn't check <laughs> well next time you gotta ask you're never gonna know these things if you don't ask you know, and you know what i can't remember if it's starbucks or boston stoker it's one of the two but you know they can make coffee you know with magnets I mean, it can work because it's all metal parts these days see the here thing. all we got is like a dancing barista that like ellen called or something <laughs> it's boring it's not even a mutant he just dances. 
So they break in and Hank, poor Hank, he looks like Gilligan to me. Does he not look like Gilligan? <laughs> He's so sad. He looks like Gilligan with the look, with the hat and everything. And then he just pulls out this big electronic thing. It's not like, oh, I don't know how anybody's not going to notice that. <laughs> what's that? Yeah. I mean, big, huge were antenna. Were just like not observant in the 70s? I guess not. I mean. They were all high. Okay. Not in the Pentagon. I hope not. <laughs> so, yeah, Hank manages to block all the signals and turn on the fire sprinklers with that little thing in 1973. Yeah, that, no, uh uh-uh. You didn't have that sort of control back then. (laughs) He's also monitoring all three channels plus PBS, and he's done (laughs) studies on, uh, he's done toxicology reports on tobacco. So, I mean, he is ahead of his time. (laughs) He is. Uh (laughs) I love that dork. <laughs> you love all the dorks. I do. They're all <laughs> they're all stupid jerks, and I love them. <laughs> okay, so eventually they get to Paris, right? And they have the big scene, which there was so much going on in that scene. In Paris, there was like seven different plot things going on simultaneously. Well, Mystique is captured. Uh, she's found out and captured. And, oh, by the way, when she becomes the general, that kick... To hold the general, the Vietnamese general to the wall, that was actually Jennifer Lawrence's kick. Really? Yes. Impressive. Very. Not even the kick so much as holding her leg up that high for as long as she did. That was all her, all real, no stunt or whatever, that it was actually her doing that. Wow. So, yeah, she becomes the Vietnamese general, and then she makes her way into the peace talks. And, of course, Trask's little mutant detector goes up, beep, 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 and... And ruins everything. Right. And of course, it's just seconds before our trio come from the jet, which we should talk about the jet, too, because that was awesome. The whole jet scene coming over and they're in the room. They're just so much going on. Wolverine seeds striker. Magneto takes an awesome shot, curves the bullet and hitting Misty. Okay, so, yes, he can control metal and he can control the bullet, but he can't see her after she's jumped out. So being able to hit her in the light, that's an awesome shot right there. That's straight out of Wanted, because he can't see her. Which you can do with magic magnetism, but you can't actually bend a bullet like that with real physics. Yeah. Oh, Wanted was real. Don't give me that. Wanted was a documentary filmed in real time. (laughs) It was like 8 millimeter the whole time. It was great. All right. So, yeah, lots of stuff. And then they see her change at the bottom and they see it's all on film and everything. It, for, so the, if the world didn't think Cuba happened, they definitely knew Paris happened. Well, yeah, because they buried Cuba. The whole island? <laughs> yep. Yes. I mean, nobody knows about Cuba anymore? No. It, Never heard Cuba's of it. like Atlantis now. It's like, <laughs> oh, you believe in Cuba? <laughs> they just nuked it to make sure it went away. <laughs> Cuba's like the urban legend. And then this is like if they caught Bigfoot tap dancing, you know, uh, alongside the Rockettes at New Year's. They do that at New Year's, right? Yeah. Okay. Talking about tap dancing, apparently Jennifer Lawrence was just loving the street scene. And in between takes, she was just dancing and and just having a great old time and everything. Apparently entertaining the crowds. Jennifer Lawrence is so adorable. She is. She is. Uh, just a whole bunch of stuff. Ha- okay, the jet. Haley, what do you want to say about the jet? That the whole scene coming over. Was Magneto pretty- did Gandalf serious wizard mode. <laughs> he did. Oh, and then rattling off all the X Men that had died that Charles didn't do anything about. That was powerful. It's like you did nothing for us. And then after the whole thing, he was busy moping. <laughs> yeah, and taking drugs or whatever. And and then after the whole thing, Wolverine is unimpressed. He's like. Just, you going to pick that shit up? Yeah, I said it. (laughs) So, all right. So, what else do you guys want to talk about? Okay, I have to talk about it because it's like the funniest thing ever to me. Every time Magneto floats, it's the funniest thing in the world to me. He's just (laughs) He's arching a little. Yeah, he's just... (laughs) It's just the look. it's, It's... Okay, young Magneto. I mean, I love Michael Fassbender. 
I love Magneto the character, but that is just the most pretentious thing in the world, and I love it. <laughs> you all know, like, you find that one friend of yours that just gets, like, really, really into something, and they're just so much like, oh, no, I know so much more. About they, get, they start getting that really arch kind of delivery when they talk about it. Like, they have to be so much more mature. It's, it's like that. But it's just his posture while he's doing that and then floating away. And I love the gifts that I've seen of like, somebody starts arguing, they, you don't like what they're arguing about, you don't like their tone of voice or whatever. And then you just see the Magneto at the end floating away, <laughs> getting out of this argument like, whoop. I don't care. I'm right and you're wrong. Old Magneto does it with dignity. Like Ian McKellen can pull the floating off with just like, yeah, whatever. Like, I've been there. I've been around. Young man, he was like, whoop. <laughs> Wasn't the same person. Well, and then you had all the mind control in the film, right? You, you had Charles talking to himself through Logan's mind. You had Charles going after Mystique, the mind meld. Oh, that was creepy. All the people in the airport. And she knows what's going on. She's like, Charles, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. And then she comes back, seduces Hank, just so she can go and smash the crap out of it. Well, I bet she wouldn't have mind seducing him either. I mean, it's like, okay, she has the new boyfriend who's a jerk, and she has the ex-boyfriend. She doesn't really agree with all the time, but he was really nice. So she goes, she's like, you know, I had a good time with you. This could have been something. And then she just kind of spoils the mood by... Being like, oh, I can't accept myself. I'm blue. And she's like, I'm blue. And he's like, but I'm blue. And then she's like, oh, fine, whatever. I'm just going to get out of here. Yeah. And then she goes and she smashes Cerebro again. <laughs> it's her thing. It's her thing. Everyone needs uh, a not thing. Not again. She did it before this time. Yeah. So she smashes it retroactively before again. Ish. I'm no good with tenses. She gets better the second time. Tenses are hard when there's time travel involved. Timey-wimey. So, yes, you have the whole thing. And in the commentary, they said they're going to explore the Hank-Mystique relationship in Apocalypse. There's going to be more of that. I brought this up on Twitter. In the comics, Azazel is Nightcrawler's father, Mystique's his mother. Right. And since Azazel is now dead, does that mean that maybe Beast is going to be... But maybe Nightcrawler's dad? Is Nightcrawler's never born now in this timeline? No, we know Nightcrawler's born because they cast him. He's uh, Cody, oh. whatever the hell, from The Road. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, the, you go forward a little bit in the film, you have that wonderful intercutting with the, with the fights going on inside the X-Mansion. Uh, you have Eric getting his helmet back, and then you have the fight going on in, in real time uh, in the future. So you had intercutting really in three different places going on and it just works so well. Oh, that was so cool. They were worried that it would be a little confusing to the viewer, but I knew exactly what was going on at least this time watching it. I don't, I can't remember if I was confused the first time around, but I definitely just, I knew what was going on, especially after just watching first class. So I, I got all the timelines, all the different things that were going on at the same time. And then of course, you know, the X mansion is destroyed and Charles sees it blows up, even though he's just trying to make the that last 30 years not happen. So, okay. Somebody brought up, I think it was on Twitter last night that Rogue was just, oh, it was in the commentary, that Rogue was just on that slab for 10 years in Cerebro. So basically, she's had a really bad time of it. <laughs> just a little she's bit. just never, Rogue can just never have anything good ever. Only in alternate timelines. Yeah, right. The way she took the power from Kitty, that was awesome. Just like, oh, yes, Bobby's dead. And Kitty's like, oh, crying, whatever. And then she just comes up, give me your power. And then I got Logan. She's... She's got stuff to do, man. I know. And then Logan was like, Woof, Rogue, you're there. It's Rogue. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. Like I said, they have this connection. They're homies. They are. By the way, right around the time of the movies, I remember back in the day, there's so many people were shipping Rogue and Wolverine. Well, it's it's so creepy, though, because she is. It really is. She's like decades younger than him. Teeny. Not anymore. Then, I would think now that they're in the realm that they could date. No, because even in that future, she's like 
30 and he's like 150. <laughs> Well, then by that rationale, it's creepy for him to date anybody who isn't nighty, which kind of exactly. reminds me of things we do in The Shadows, which, by the way, is the best vampire movie ever. 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 So you're talking about Magneto being a little bit pretentious, young Eric, you know, flying around, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Don't piss him off, because if you do, he'll just take his ball stadium and go home. <laughs> <laughs> Magneto floats down into the baseball field, floats away with the baseball field. Not just his ball, not just his bat, the entire stadium. Yeah, there you go. And of course, Stan Lee was supposed to have a cameo inside the stadium, but he was sick and could not do that. That is why Stan Lee did not have a cameo in this movie. Sad day. According to Brian Singer. All right. What else have we not talked about? Uh, Trask's master plan to use the mutants as the unifying force for humans to fight against was very Ozymandias in Watchmen. Yeah. He's like Watchmen before there was Watchmen. Like, back when Alan Moore was just, like, a grumbly teenager. Well, and he's still around, too. Because at the end of the movie, he's in Magneto's prison. Yeah, it's like Magneto's number was, like, 0001, and his is 0002. He's got, like, the scraggly beard. The beard. The he's just lying the there. <laughs> he is a lion. I get it, because he's a lion. There you go. So... Yeah, the whole thing with the bunker getting taken out, and it was just a powerful scene. It was the whole thing at the end around the White House, which, how do you, wow, how do you clear a stadium that's going to take some work? Just a little bit. The mess that they do filming these films, I mean, come on. <laughs> no wonder we're billions and trillions of dollars in debt. We have to clean up after movies. Right? Yeah. Okay, anything else, Lauren? Uh, the very end of the movie, I was, I remember the first time I saw it, you start seeing all these people. I got all happy because first you see Kitty and Colossus when they're co-teaching a class. And for those who don't know, Kitty and Colossus were together for a really long time in the comics. Currently, Colossus is off doing his own thing because he went a little bit nuts after he got the Phoenix Force in him. And Kitty is currently engaged to Star-Lord. And then you see Rogue and Bobby together again, and you see Storm, and she's still alive. And you see... Hank? Yeah, you see Hank, and he's played by Kelsey Grammer again, and I was real happy about that. Because he really was the perfect beast. He is. And then you see the, the biggest middle finger the movie can give to X3, Cyclops and Jean. <laughs> But you don't see Cyclops at first. You got Logan going, oh, Gene, oh, Gene. Am Scott's I hallucinating like, again? And then Cyclops is like, whoa, buddy. I boy. wish they had done what they did in the cartoon and had Wolverine and Storm together. That would have been cool. I always did like them as a couple. Yep. But no such luck. They were just like awesome power couple together. Remember when I was talking about the boy from the introduction scene that was climbing the T2? Totally cable. Yeah. He was the first boy that Logan sees when he comes out of his room. Oh, yeah. I think I caught that the first time I watched the movie, and I missed it this time because I think I was typing. And then, of course, Logan is fished out of the Potomac, not by Bill Stryker, but by Miss. I love how that scene completely recalled him on the uh, adamantium slab in Weapon X. Mm -hmm. He's just there. He's shirtless. He's lying on this slab grid thing. You see Stryker above him, but then you see the eyes flash. And I was like, oh... Okay. Still, that would be horrible. I don't know how long he was down there. You're constantly drowning. Yeah. No, they did that, I think, in Ultimate X-Men. Early, and I think maybe the second arc of the comics, there was a fight between Wolverine and Sabretooth, where Sabretooth tries to kill Wolverine by drowning him, and he mentions that. He's like, um, I know you can recover from anything. Can you recover from drowning, or are you just going to be there drowning the whole time while your body's just constantly regenerating your brain cells and then wolverine stabs him in the nards <laughs> <laughs> like you do like you do all right any last words for the movie lauren lots of fun can't wait for the next one and sabanur oh let's talk about the shawarma scene okay so for those who don't know and sabanur is the name of apocalypse because he was born he's the first mutant he was born in ancient egypt and worshipped as a god and yeah, things get really bad around him, so. Just a little bit. You know, it kind of reminded me of the end scene when he's building the pyramid, 
kind of reminded me a little bit about Pixels because it kind of looked like a cheap video game from the 80s or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looked a little Tetrisy, whatever. But anyway, yeah. So, yep, definitely going to get Apocalypse and the Four Horsemen. We saw them. So, yes. Going to get some goodness there. Yes. Haley, what do you got? I think we've talked about everything. Whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> Whip. Lash. All right. So your favorite speedster, Barry Allen, Quicksilver, Age of Ultron, or Quicksilver in this movie? This Quicksilver is better than Age of Ultron Quicksilver, but I like Barry Allen better than both. And that is not an opinion by somebody that might or might not happen to have a Flash podcast. <laughs> but, you know, you also have a, you know, you're co-hosting the Marvel podcast. So there you go. Yeah, it's somebody that has some breadth of knowledge there. All right. It was an amazing movie. I'm glad I watched it. I watched it twice. It was the uh, best five hours I spent in a long time. And it was fun. I'm glad we did this. So thank you very much, Haley, for putting it on the schedule. Yes. You're welcome. All right. Next week, we'll have a couple of surprises for you. It is the last week before Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s Jen's back up. And so we will be getting on to that in two weeks but stay tuned next week we'll have a couple of fun things at you so in the meantime we've got some fun segments coming at you so let's get to it right yep let's do it This is the point in the podcast where we actually talk comic books like we haven't already, right? But we're talking specifically comics that are out recently in the past week or so. First up, we have none other than Mr. Adam talking about S.H.I.E.L.D. issue on Quake. This is Consultant Black Adam with your mission report for the 50 Years of S.H.I.E.L.D. Quake one-shot. This story takes place shortly after the end of the Secret Warriors series that Quake was a lead in. Minutes before a mission to gain some intelligence on Norman Osborn and what's left of Hammer, Daisy Johnson is reassigned to the first team. There isn't much time to talk to the team's leader before they begin their attack on an AIM facility. During the mission, she discovers that the biological weapons AIM is researching are a group of inhuman children and is forced to make a difficult decision. Will she justify Captain America's decision to recruit her and figure out her place in the Avengers? This was a pretty good story showing Daisy trying to find her place on the Avengers team and establishing connections with the various team members, and an inhuman named Jai Ying who seemed to know who she was. The art was interesting, though not as photorealistic as some issues we've seen. Next week's 50 Years of S.H.I.E.L.D. one-shot will feature Agent Carter and Dum Dum Dugan. They're hitting all the good ones, aren't they? Definitely. Yeah. I uh, actually just bought the S.H.I.E.L.D. one-shot with Peggy Carter today. It was a lot of fun. I need to read the Quake one now. I know! So cool. Thank you, Adam, for keeping us informed of the latest on the S.H.I.E.L.D. issues. It's great. Yes. And next, we have a little segment, just a small segment that we do every week called the Mighty Marvel Moment. And here we at it. Hi, agents. Neil here with your Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Marvel Moment, covering new releases from the week of September 9th, 2015. Marvel keeps the hits coming this week with some really good issues, including only two issues that fall outside the Secret Wars event, as well as the final issues in some of the Secret Wars arcs. So what are we waiting for? Let's get into it. Starting off this week is Ms. Marvel number 18, Last Days, where writer G. Willow Wilson gives us the conclusion of the epic team-up between Carol Dan and Kamala Khan on the eve of the incursion event. Adrian Alfona's art really shines through in this issue and highlights another great Ms. Marvel story that really focuses on the importance of Kamala's family. The only other non-Secret Wars book this week is another installment in the 50-year anniversary of S.H.I.E.L.D. This week we get S.H.I.E.L.D. Quake number one, but since this is part of the S.H.I.E.L.D. event, as usual, I'm going to leave it to consultant Black Adam to give you all the juicy details in his mission report. That's it for non-Secret Wars titles. Now let's dive back into Secret Wars. 
A-Force number four gives us the penultimate story of She-Hulk and the protectors of Arcadia as they finally discover who the traitor is that has brought down the Wrath of Doom. I really enjoyed the pacing of this book, and especially the massive fight scenes with the Thors, as well as with the villain of this book. Seeing Valkyrie and Gamora as Thors was also kinda awesome, and the cliffhanger ending has me wishing the next issue was already out. Spider-Man Renew Your Vows number 5 ends this fantastic series, which gave us a married Peter and MJ, as well as their daughter Annie Mae Parker, living in a corner of Battleworld ruled by the Regent. This issue gives us a look at what happens when all the Parkers stand together, as well as a truly fantastic scene in which Peter realized what is truly at stake. It literally took my breath away. For all those reasons and more, I'm making this my book of the week this week. 1602 Witch Hunter Angela number 3 also came out this week, and while I've been a big fan of this series from the start, this issue kinda lost me. Now don't get me wrong, the art and panel layout were amazing, but this week, the Shakespearean edition of the Cloak and Dagger story in a play within a play, as well as the story of the 1602 Rogue, seemed unnecessarily complex. The end of the book was also a bit of a letdown, I'm not sure where the story is going to go from here, or if it's actually over. Planet Hulk number 5 ends another Secret Wars series, and while some people have complained writer Steve Humphrey's version of Cap doesn't resemble the character most of us know and love, I actually think this series has a ton of great things going for it. Mark Lamming's art was actually outstanding, and I loved the more gritty and unrepentant take on Steve Rogers. I recommend checking out the previews and judging for yourself. I'm betting you'll want to keep reading. Red Skull number 3 finishes off the story of Crossbones and Magneto across the shield wall on their hunt for Red Skull, and in one panel in particular, the story gives a nod and a wink to a classic X-Men image. While there is a lot of Magneto in the Secret Wars universe, this take on the character seemed a bit more desperate and less regal, and really pulled me in. Despite only being three issues, I enjoyed this series, and the ending was pretty satisfying. So if you're a fan of Magneto, villain team-ups in general, and sudden but inevitable betrayal, then check out issues one through three. Secret Wars 2099, issue number five, finishes up this look at the future versions of Cap, Iron Man, Hulk, and the rest of the future Defenders, as Baron Mordo's descendant opens an interdimensional portal and unleashes a godlike squid creature, which I'm pretty sure is separate and legally distinct from Cthulhu. While it was fun to look ahead into the future, this series doesn't feel like there are any consequences. But if you love the 2099 universe, check it out and judge for yourself. Civil War number 4 finally brings us the massive battle between Steve Rogers' Blue Nation and Tony Stark's Iron Nation. This battle has been building since the first issue and the introduction of a third mysterious force resulting from Tony Stark's capture complicates matters and adds to the tension. This has been a great series and this issue is no exception. I really connected with the art as well as the portrayal of a battle-worn and weary Steve Rogers. If you're a fan of the Civil War storyline, you have to pick this up. Also this week, we get Korvac Saga number 4, which ends another solid Secret Wars series which has been flying below the radar. This issue gives us what I hope won't be our final looks at the classic Guardians of the Galaxy, including Vance Astro, Yondu, Charlie 27, and the rest of the team, as well as some of the other formerly deceased galactic heroes like Captain Marvel and Moondragon. The series has managed to build intention over the last four issues, and the gripping ending adds a key piece to the Secret Wars mythos. This is a great finale, and I'm sad to see this series end. And finally, Mrs. Deadpool and the Howling Commandos number 4 ends this crazy Secret Wars series with a final showdown between Sheikla and her Marvel monster allies as they face off against Dracula. As with the past issues, the ghost of Deadpool is always nearby to give the reader his take on the action, and Deadpool does not disappoint. As always, this book delivered on the laughs, and surprisingly, ties into the Secret Wars overall story quite nicely. Battle World Siege number 3 is the only title I didn't get to pick up this week, so head on over to the forums or send in an email or voicemail to the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. crew and tell me what I missed. 
That's it for new releases. Now let's crack open the Mylar and take a look back at a classic back issue. This week's long box pick is the result of wandering around a great local comic shop over the weekend looking for some hidden gems. I actually picked up the Defenders trade paperback collecting issues 1 through 6 of the 2012 run as well as issue number 7 of Fear itself, all from writer Matt Fraction. This reboot of the Defenders franchise from 2012 mixes in some of the old and new Defenders, pairing Doctor Strange, Namor and the Silver Surfer with the Red She-Hulk Betty Ross and Iron Iron Fist. While it's not my favorite portrayal of the Sorcerer Supreme, Betty Ross as She-Hulk kicks some serious butt, and Danny Rand, Namor, and the Surfer were all really solid. The overall storyline ties up the loose ends from the Fear Itself event and builds upon some of the fallout from this in a six-issue satisfying arc. Again, that's the 2012 Defenders trade paperback from Matt Fraction collecting issues one through six of the Defenders. Keep your eyes open for this one, gang. Later, guys! Many comics. He missed an issue. Did you hear that? I he know. missed a whole I'm issue. I'm still so impressed. No, a lot of these sound so good. I've been really wanting to read A Force and the 1602 stuff. I, I really loved the original run of 1602. So I need to, like, once these are all in collections, uh, I need to look into this. What caught my eye on this was the Korvac Saga number four with uh, deceased heroes like Captain Marvel and Moon Dragon. I actually have read some of that, so I'm like, oh, I get that reference. Uh, I want to read some more of that. <laughs> I understood that reference. Exactly. I love every week that Neil comes in and does this because it lets us keep chaps on what's going on out there. And thank you very much, Neil. We really appreciate it, sir. We really do. You are doing amazing stuff for a lot of people. Thank you, sir. My hat is off. All righty. Anything else to say about these comics? They're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait till I catch up. <laughs> what year? Are you in 72 yet? Or are you still stuck in 71? I have not had a lot of time to read lately. <laughs> So you need to carve out time. You need to catch up. I need up. to carve out some time to edit some podcasts too. But <laughs> yeah, me too. What are you going to do? Yeah, I know. Hit me right here. Hit me right here, Smalls. All right. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go on and get to our news of the week. And thank you again to Adam and Neil. We really appreciate it. So we have a little bit of news this week, starting out with a recap, a update on Dub Smash Wars. Yay! Yay. Okay. So I wasn't here last week, so I couldn't talk about the Wrecking Ball one, which was amazing. <laughs> it was fun. Like, each time a new person came in, you're like, oh, it keeps getting better. And then Patton Oswald comes in, and you're like, oh, this is a magical moment. I'm still here for Team Carter, man. Well, Team Carter raised the stakes this week with the one, the only, Stanley. How have I not seen this? Oh, because I was spinning all day. <laughs> I need to see this. Well, take 10 seconds. Go watch. Oh, also making an appearance, Lola. <gasps> Lola switch teams oh, for the Dub Smash Wars. I definitely need to see this. Oh, how have I not seen it? Oh, I was at work. That's why. All right. Psh, get your priorities straight. I will see it after the cast. That's great. It's 10 seconds, dude. Yeah, I know. But, okay, so we have got the Dub Smash War. What's the uh, amount up to now? All right. Team Carter has $19,943 for stomp out bullying. And Team Shield has $22,711 for St. Jude's. But I think that's probably mostly based on round one. Team Shield hasn't posted their round two video yet. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm watching it right now. <laughs> James Darcy has nice legs. We've seen that before, though. Okay. Yeah, you, you won't know until you see it, but he's wearing a blonde wig <laughs> and he's leaning over cleaning Lola seductively. Stanley and Haley Atwell are in Lola. Well, he was wearing lipstick in a dress last time, so Yeah, but you can yeah. see his legs. Yeah, okay. Well, it's all about the legs. We know this. Okay, so it's all for charity. This is for charity and they're you know, the loser has to do some really nasty stuff, but everybody's winning in this. It's fun. It's entertainment. And thank you very much to the crews of both Agent Carter and 
Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. of giving us this incredible entertainment. We really appreciate it. And talking about entertainment, you know, we just finished our summer rewatch of Daredevil and we're like, ah, geez, I, when is Jessica Jones going to show up? It's sometime by the end of the year, but we're not sure when. It might be at Star Wars, but if it's at Star Wars, everybody's going to be watching Star Wars for a multiple time. Well, Marvel decided on their date, didn't they? Hey, guess when? So, uh, I forget when it was. Uh, September 10th is when this video says it was published. But we're talking about Jessica Jones now. Yeah, Jessica. Yes. But this video came up and said premiere announcement, Jessica Jones. And I saw it on Twitter and I started screaming. <laughs> were you just like scaring me incoherently or were you like, Jessica Jones? No, I just started screaming. Okay. Like just incoherent screaming. It's awesome. And then I started watching the video and then I started screaming again. And the video itself, I watched it like five times. And the, the gist of it is the premiere, all episodes will be on November 20th. And oh my God, <laughs> I can't wait. It's so close. It's so close. She says two and a half months from yeah. the time when it's going. Well, two months. But it's happening. It's happening. Unless the it's zombie happening. apocalypse happens first. So if you're watching Fear of the Walking Dead, it like happens within 12 hours. So. If we can make it to November 20th, we're, we're fine. But yeah, it has like, you know, little clips of stuff. You see this uh, intersection, which is, I'm guessing, and I need to reread. I, I have the alias comics. I need to reread them to make sure. But I'm guessing this is probably going to be the street where maybe the accident happens, where she gets her powers. And then, which is uh, Birch and Higgins. And then you hear like whispering, and it's David Tennant whispering her name. This is all through like a haze of like purple and reds. And then you see like the city with her standing there. And then it's like, it's time the world knew her name. And mm -hmm. then Jessica Jones. And then you hear Jessica again. And it, oh my God. I can't wait. I can't wait. So what you're saying is you're looking forward to this? <laughs> uh, yeah. You have positive expectations? I have very positive expectations. So I watched a little bit of BBC America lately, and they were running hashtag Doctor's Finest in preparation for the September 19th premiere of Series 9 of Doctor Who, which Haley might or might not know anything about. But What? Doctor what? Doctor how? So anyway, this is which? I watched The Time of the Doctor, and at the end of that, you know, I could definitely see David Tennant as a prick because he went off the rails quite a bit in that. And he was a bad guy in Harry Potter. Uh, that yeah. too. That too. So all sorts of crazy. Right. So he's going to do well as a purple man. It's going to be fun and it's going to be fun seeing on the screen, on the big screen. So, well, small screen, but big screen for me because I got a big TV. So that's the news. Jessica Jones, November 20th. We are, will have a great turkey day. Well, we will try to stay awake in the coma watching Jessica Jones. I'm just, I'm not going to talk to anybody. I'm just going to be there watching <laughs> forever. So we did get a little bit of news about Daredevil season two, didn't we? It's happening. Yay! But we already knew that. There's a character returning. Stick will be back, played by Scott Glenn. Yay! I don't Yay! think that's a huge surprise to anybody. We kind of expected to see him come back, but it's been confirmed. Yeah. So, does it say how many episodes he's going to be in? I don't think it did. I think it just said he was going to be in season two. Because I was a little bit disappointed that we only saw him in one episode of season one. But, you know, okay. I see where it's going. And... Oh, uh, do you mind if we do a real quick aside from, or is that <sighs> waiting in the comments with uh, Stick and... Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, earlier today, somebody on Twitter, Arcanity23? Yep. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Stick, mentioned that, we remember when we were talking about that episode, Stick, ha! Huh? And we were like, oh, who's this guy? Who's this guy? Is he from Cunlan? Well... Turns out, if you go by the, I guess, end credits, funny that, that his name is Stone. Stick, Stone, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, so I haven't gotten to this point in the comics yet. Right. Because I'm only at the very beginning of the Frank Miller run. Yeah, and we know Haley's not there. But... I'm getting there. Yeah, uh, he's one of the ninjas from the chased cell, and... His name is Stone. He operated with his master Stick, and there's also other ninjas named Claw, Shaft, Star, Flame, and Wing. <laughs> Shaft. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I'm just talking about Shaft. Yeah. Shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's who uh, everyone else is guessing. That's who I guess this is uh, supposed to be. He's created by Frank Miller. He, I guess, helped revive Electra. And in uh, the Ultimate Universe, Stone is an old lady who taught Electra and her friends to defend themselves from bullies in the university. But I don't think that's this version because that didn't look like an old lady to me. Right. So I just want to say thank you very much to our Kennedy 23. We really appreciate the shout out and the information. We really do. And uh, you gave us a couple other tweets, too. So we really appreciate that. We also got some more information just recently about some, and this is unconfirmed, and I know this is going against my rule of unconfirmed stuff, but this is just too juicy not to talk about. And it's about all the upcoming Marvel Netflix after we get done with what we're talking about. So what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? An unnamed source, so that's how you know it can be trusted, <laughs> has said that for their next date uh, slate of Netflix shows, they want to do Moon Knight with Bushman as the main villain, uh -huh. The Punisher with Jigsaw as the main villain, uh -huh. Deathlock with Fixer as the main villain, uh -huh. and Spider Woman with Madame Ooh, Hydra as the main villain. My favorite. It's going to be good. And I am actually in favor of all of those, especially Spider Woman, because Jessica Drew is amazing. Uh huh. Yeah. So that would be awesome. We got a lot of comments on that when we posted it on Facebook today and just a lot of positive vibes on this slate. Yeah, so, of course, it's unconfirmed. We don't know if this is actually what it's going to be. want to foot stomp that unconfirmed. But if this right. is it, we're all in. I'm wondering how many of these shows that they're throwing out there they're planning on having more than one season of. Because at that point, it would be eight ongoing Netflix Marvel shows. Seems like a lot. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know how how far they're going to continue some of these Netflix shows. I mean, there's a lot of characters in the Marvel universe. They might be, you know, bringing people in, taking people out, and just trying to cycle through them before, you know, this comic book boon drops out of the sky. Trying to make money while they can, so to speak. So strike while the iron's hot. Exactly. Got to make that gold. So we'll see. And I'm looking forward to however it pans out because they haven't let us down yet. So it's all cool. Matter of fact, a lot of people are saying even Ant-Man was the best movie of the summer. And so they were so-so about, you know, talking to people after the fact. They're so-so about Avengers 2. But Ant-Man are like, eh, that's pretty good. And I won't count Mad Max in there because it was before the summer. I, I would say Avengers was the start of summer. So th there you go. Okay. So we do have a teaser on another upcoming Avengers movie, of course, Infinity War. So what's up with that? Okay, so yes, we get to see high definition of Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet. Nice. Yeah. All lit up, colorful and everything. It's bright and shiny. Mm-hmm. And that's it. It's not even a teaser trailer, a tr teaser image. It's it's an image. It's just a still of him being like, look at my jewelry. Isn't it shiny? That's the money shot. That's what everybody wants to see. They want to see the gauntlet, and they want to see what is going to go on there. And another thing everybody's going to want to see is, guess what? Rachel McAdams is going to be in Doctor Strange. Woo! Yay! Yeah! <laughs> I was actually just talking with some friends like last week about how awesome Rachel McAdams is. She is. And I just, just can't wait for this to come out now. It's my new favorite movie. <laughs> yeah. She didn't even say, you know, what her role is going to be or anything. But looking at her right now, my guess would be Clea. Yeah. That's, I think, everyone's guess. All right. All right. We'll see. But I'm looking forward to it now. Like I wasn't before, but I, because, you know, cover batch, but. We've got some good stuff going on there. And uh, we have a loss, though. We're talking about all these ads. We have a loss. Gambit is losing Rupert Wyatt. The director. Right. And it's not creative differences or anything from what I'm hearing. It's a scheduling issue because they had to push back the start date for Gambit shooting. It started to conflict with his next project, so he wouldn't be able to do it. That's a bummer. Do, who do you think they're going to get to replace that? I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know directors well enough to be like, oh, this is the person they're going to go get. Right. Yeah, I have no idea. Well, we'll see. I mean, it's hit or miss over there with Fox right and, now. And this is breaking news. This just came out earlier today as we're recording. Right. So. It's not in the news, but 
Fantastic Four got a second movie and they are indeed going to proceed with it's like wh- why I, I have the biggest questions about that whole thing it's just it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever and they're gonna head it good well it, you know they're loss I guess yeah I had some friends go see Fantastic Four because they had planned to see another movie but that one was sold out and they were like well we drove all this way. We may as well go see a We're movie. We're here. We bought the popcorn. We might as well. Basically, yes. Uh, they went all the way to the Alamo Draft House. They were like, well... We've already got our purse stuffed with candy and pop, so... Yeah. Uh, well, you can get beer there. But apparently the beer didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't seen it. Oh, you are not missing from, out. From you are not missing out. <laughs> From everything that I've heard, you can clearly see the delineation from one director to the next. And I've heard that as well. It is fine up to a point, and then it just takes a turn, and you just... Well, I've heard it's it's mediocre up to a point, and then it gets terrible. My friend's girlfriend said, Okay, you know how everyone talks about Sue Storm's unfortunate wig that you could tell was there for the reshoots? That is nothing compared to Miles Teller's horribly covered up acne. Poor kid. Yeah. Well, apparently he's a jerk, so... Alrighty, so what's not a jerk is some cosmic mix music that Haley just happens to like. Right. So for Guardians of the Galaxy, the movie, we had Awesome Mix Volume 1. For Guardians of the Galaxy, their cartoon, they have Cosmic Mix Volume 1, <laughs> which is music from the first season of the cartoon. And they've you can pre-order it now. The track list is going to be hooked on a feeling, which <laughs> we, yeah, yes. Okay. And then they're going to do Funk Number 49 by the James Gang. Yes. Drift Away by Dobie Gray. Right. Very yes. Walk Away by the James Gang. Right. Yes. Boys Are Back in Town by Thin Lizzy. Nice. Yes. Shake Your Groove Thing by Peaches and Herb. <laughs> yeah. Right. Funk Funk by Cameo. Yeah. Right. Joy to the World by Three Dog Night. Yay. I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. Very yes. Rocky Mountain Way by Joe Walsh. Yep. So You Are a Star by the Hudson Brothers. Mm -hmm. And then Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Very yes. Which I can't hear without thinking of Shaun of the Dead. (laughs) (laughs) There's so many things that are attributed to that movie. It was just a good movie. So yeah, lots of good stuff and looking forward to it. Of course, we all... I actually own both soundtracks from Guardians of the Galaxy, both the uh, Awesome Mix 1 and the actual score from the movie, and they're uh, they're all great. Ferris and I go back every once in a while like, oh, have you listened to it lately? Oh yeah, this morning. Yeah, only all the time. Definitely. Uh, like I said, you can pre-order it now. It'll be available for purchase on October 16th. Just in time for your holiday shopping. You haven't started your holiday shopping yet? <laughs> nope. Yeah, actually, I Me have. Either. But we're good. Okay, so that's it for. Uh, did anybody have any other news? I don't think so. I think that's it for this week. All right, the shows are coming back soon. So yeah, two weeks. There's a lot. If you want to go look for it, there's a lot of like production stills and stuff like that. They're starting to release some of the bonus features that are going to be on the Blu-ray for Age of Ultron. You can go find those videos as well. Mm-hmm. If you want to look for that stuff. Yeah, lots of good stuff. Lots of good stuff. It's just a good time to be a comic book fan. All right, we're going to get to some feedback now. All righty. We, of course, had a ton of feedback this week, which is awesome. Just want to say thank you to Richard for telling us that Jessica Jones was going to be November 20th. You are the reason, sir, that I knew about that. So thank you very much. Our friend, the operator, co-creator of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. tweeted us and he had watched the Muppets Clerk Greg video and he just said, "Okay, that was awesome. (laughs) (laughs) And it was it was if you haven't seen it yet, it's one of the many trailers that ABC has out. And um, who is it? Shrimp? Is that his name? The Muppet? Uh, Pepe the Prawn. Uh, Pepe the Prawn is trying to get secrets out of Clark Gregg, and he's like, no, go away, go away. And the animal finally comes in. He's like, Agent Animal, take care of this. He can't take anything. He's like, all right, I'll go away. So is Agent Animal one of the Marvel snipers? Now, yes. Now he (laughs) is. Uh, Animal with a gun, that's an interesting proposition. He doesn't need a gun. He's a wrecking ball. 
Yeah, he came in like a wrecking ball, you might say. Did you guys see <laughs> Richard's tweet of us of the sign that he saw? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Best day ever. <laughs> so that was cool. And the Luke Cage. Luke Cage. Luke Cage. Did you see the Luke Cage stills that yes. Richard tweeted us? Yes. It's all great. It's all happening. It is. It is. And, oh, did you guys see the still that Marvel put out of Stick Bean Back? Yeah, with the little ice cream bracelet thing. Right, and the picture of Stick and... Yeah, and Little Matt. Right, so that's awesome. So, as I mentioned on Facebook, we had a lot of feedback for the potential of the next upcoming Netflix shows. Some people are mildly interested. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, Richard... Nicholas, it, we had a lot of people, and thank you very much for commenting. We get your excitement. We are excited as well, so thank you very much. So as always, if you have feedback, you can get us on the various means. You can email us. You can give us a voicemail, because we do have one, and that is 844-THE-BUS-1 or 844-843-2871, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr. We have it all. You guys ready to walk this one out? Yep. Let's go. Woo, we made it to the end. We're a little long this week, but guess what? We had an awesome movie to talk about. It's awesome. Thanks for putting it on the schedule, Haley. You're welcome. You win on this one. I always win. Well, you didn't win on... Remember those other movies that weren't that bad <laughs> that you guys watched and I failed on? <laughs> what about Flash 1990? <laughs> It's so bad. <laughs> so you lost on that one. Okay. So thank you guys very much for coming and joining us this week. We really appreciate it. And yes, we did go a little long, but we had awesomeness to talk about. And we also had the awesomeness of Adam and Neil. Want to thank you guys again. You guys are awesome for giving us that audio. Really appreciate that. Yeah, and thank you to everybody who has gotten a hold of us on Twitter, whether it's with news, with feedback, or during the live tweets. We love hearing from you. We love you. You guys make this just all fun and worthwhile and awesome. Right. And remember, when you're sending feedback, we still have the Ant-Man crate giveaway going on. So let us know what you liked or didn't like about it. Send us feedback in any way, Twitter. Facebook, any way we take feedback, you can send that to us and you'll be entered for a chance to win. The funnier you make it, the higher your chances to win. But at this point in time, just send it in because we want your feedback. All right. So that's it for this week. We will be back next week and then it will be Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So until next time, I'm Agent Stargate Pioneer. I'm Agent Haley. And I'm Agent Lauren. Bye. See you guys next week. Bye. Later. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you'll find all of our contact information in other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod and can be found at incompetech.com. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual host and do not represent Legends, Stream, or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation. No infringement is intended. Broadcast has been successfully terminated.